Okay, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Carrico. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Studies of American Economics, welcome tonight. I think we're going to have a fun conversation. Uh, CSAB likes to say that we're about providing a forum for civil and social discourse. Uh, but if you were watching the primary debate, uh, the primary debate this year, uh, I think it's very safe. Perhaps a little bit of a dark one. So our topic tonight is on political polarization. <coughs> and some of the political uh, and economic, uh, uh, political economy aspects of it. And uh, to kick us off, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Sarah, the junior political science major, to introduce our speaker. Uh, before I do that, I also want to have a, a brief commercial. Uh, we all come back from spring break a couple weeks after that. Uh, we'll have a big uh, conference on the topic of privacy. The topic is the expectation. Uh, the keynote uh, with the head of the FBI, uh, Dr. James Comey. And we'll have some journalists, and think tank people, and policy analysts, and ex government people uh, over the course of April 6 to 8. This is something the Center does every two years, and we hope you all stay tuned for the next month. So, thank you very much. And Sarah, I hope you have a good speaker. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. Our speaker tonight is Dr. James Pearson. He is the president of the William E. Simon Foundation, a private grant-making foundation located in New York City. Uh, Mr. Pearson is also a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute in New York, also a think tank, where he's the director for the Center for American University. He also advises other foundations, including the Thomas W. Smith Foundation, which liaises with policymakers and tries to provide policy solutions. Uh, Mr. Pearson is the author of Shattered Consensus, The Rise and Decline of America's Post-War Political Order. That is on sale in the front if you're interested after this talk. And he's also authored Camelot and the Cultural Revolution, How the Assassination of John F. Kennedy, Shattered American Liberalism, and many other books and articles online. Our topic tonight is political polarization, and it comes at a very timely moment in American politics. Given what Mr. Caraco said, that our politics right now is very divided, we see this in the discourse, we see this in the 2016 election, when politicians from the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are so far divided that it's unclear whether or not we can find common ground today. In a system which is so dependent on compromise, and politicians coming together to provide solutions and common goods to citizens. What can we expect when our politics right now seems very unlikely to come back to compromise? Mr. Pearson's going to tell us about political polarization and hopefully provide us some insight into how we might decide in November and further. Please help me in giving Mr. Pearson a warm Kenyan welcome. Democrats. 
course, the Democratic Party for a long time was based in the South, and that was the most conservative part of the country, and all those people were Democrats. So that in the post-war era, up until relatively recently, if you wanted to pass anything important, you had to get both parties to buy in to some degree to get a majority. Because, uh, you know, the parties were so badly split internally, that required the degree of bipartisanship. So if you just look at the Civil Rights Acts that Lyndon Johnson was able to pass in the mid-1960s, he could not have passed those without overwhelming support from Republicans. It turned out that the uh, Republican candidate in 1964 was one of the few Republicans who voted against the Civil Rights Bill, and that tended to tar the Republican Party. But uh, in the Senate, I believe that three-quarters of Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Bill in 1964. They voted for the Voting Rights Bill. A lot of them voted for Medicare and Medicaid, the landmark uh, pieces of legislation out of the mid-1960s. Well, that's all changed. The parties, uh, over a period of time, have evolved such that uh, they're now openly ideological. The Republican Party is a very conservative party, ideologically and increasingly the Democratic Party is a liberal party, such that there really is no longer any overlap within Congress, ideologically, between the two parties. So the most conservative Democrat is still more liberal than the most liberal Republican. There's no overlap at all. That makes it difficult for them to uh, pass legislation that requires a kind of bipartisan spirit. Obamacare was, of course, passed, I'm hearing an echo, uh, on a straight party line vote, no Republicans voted for it, but you have a situation where all the Republicans are pledged to repeal it as soon as they come into office. So that's an unstable situation uh, with regard to that. A lot of public opinion polling has re uh, suggested the same thing, that over a period of time, uh, the electorate is increasingly divided into uh, people on the left, liberals, people on the right, conservatives so that the number of people percentage of the electorate at the center is gradually diminished over time. When I was in school, we used to learn that you had to think about the electorate as a, as a bell-shaped curve with a large number of people in the middle and going down a few number of people at the extreme, such that the two parties had to compete for the median voter, that voter right in the center, so they tended to converge in a general election, and that made, it, that, that made for moderate parties that could compromise with one another. But public <coughs> opinion now appears divided to, to the point where you have a couple of lumps, a liberal lump over on one side and a conservative lump on the other. The two parties appeal to their bases, the liberal base and a conservative base, and they get elected on that basis <coughs> by rallying them. Uh, and there's not enough uh, on either side to command an absolute majority. So each side has enough voters to, to veto whatever the other side so, uh, this apparently started with the Republican Party moving to the right in the 1980s. I was, I was saying over dinner that in 1975, <coughs> there was a Republican president by the name of Gerald Ford, who was pro-choice on abortion, Republican, and he was in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment. <coughs> and his wife was even more liberal than he was. This is a Republican president. 1975. Richard Nixon, who preceded him, uh, uh, started affirmative action. Uh, he passed. He he passed. He got legislation to pass to create the Environmental Protection Agency, and several other bills that we regard as fairly liberal. So the Republican Party in that period was fairly centrist, if not liberal. Um, that all changed in the 1980s. Ronald Reagan took the Republican Party to the right, and it continued to move to the right. The Democratic Party began to move leftward in the 1990s, and has continued to move leftward since then. The, but probably a defining moment was the 1994 congressional elections, when the Republicans won a majority in the House in Bill Clinton's first term. <coughs> and basically what happened is that the Republican Party captured the South. And all those former Democrats in the South, conservative Democrats in the South, became Republicans. And uh, all the conservatives uh, in the North became Republicans. 
so this, this tended to uh, create a division, an ideological division between the parties, which is relatively new. Now we've had polarization in American politics in the past. We were polarized over slavery, for example, in the 1850s, south and north. Uh, later on, we were polarized between business and labor. Um, later on in the 1960s over the Vietnam War, these tended to be passing issues and they were not ideological. The new aspect of American politics that makes the polarization difficult is it seems to be semi-permanent and is ideological, not organized around a particular interest. Now, is this a bad thing? Now, in Federalist Number 10, uh, Madison says, well, uh, he doesn't talk about polarization, but he says that uh, a country that's divided into many different interests, such that it's difficult to get a consensus, that's generally a good thing. That tends to provide a check on government, and in order to get a majority, you have to appeal, appeal generally to a large number of different interests. So stalemate was not such a bad thing in Madison's eyes. Now, I suppose it's different today. We weren't a superpower in 1787 and 1788, and we didn't have a complex economy of the kind that we have today. So the polarization creates stalemate. The stalemate makes it difficult to address difficult questions. A few years ago, they tried to have a comprehensive solution to immigration. One side was going to get border control. The other side was going to get various things. A uh, path to citizenship or a path to legalization or whatever. Turned out it all broke down because they couldn't trust one another. So nothing happened, and here we are seven years later, five years later, three years later, nothing's happened, and the problem is still there. Uh, that's the problem with polarization and stalemate. Now, on top of that, I think I'd say you do have, in addition to the polarization, we have this weird thing going on today, which is you have this angry electorate. So that reinforces the whole situation. I suppose you could have you could have polarization between two sides that were not angry, but when you have people mad at one another, openly disliking one another, I think uh, somebody did a survey in the 1950s. They asked people uh, uh, if your son or daughter married someone from uh, a different religion, would that bother you, Protestant Catholic? Yes. That would really concern me. What about a different political party? I don't care. Today it's just reversed. People don't care if your son or daughter marries somebody from a different religion, but if they marry someone from a different political party, that's a big problem. Because now you have to talk to them at family reunions and dinner parties. And all this. So uh, that suggests somewhat where we are. Uh, now, I would just layer on top of that you've got the polarization, you've got the anger, you also have a kind of a dysfunction government. You know, there's the joke that government uh, couldn't organize a two-car funeral. Now, that's an overstatement, but look, after World War II, well, World War II, we win World War II. We invent the atom bomb. We build the interstate highway system. We find a cure for polio. We shoot a man to the moon. Government can do a lot of good things. You know, uh, in the last 30 or so years, you know, the space program hasn't gone quite so well. We can't build any highways because all the veto groups come in and stop us from building anything or a bridge or whatever. Our bridges and highways are falling down. Uh, government, our, the pension systems that we have are underwater because the government, the money is being misspent. So there's an idea out there that the government can't really accomplish anything in addition to that. So you've got a layered series of problems dealing with the performance of government. So, uh, what's behind this and what does it mean? I don't have any good answers. I have some theories which I'm going to throw out to you. And my general view is that, hopefully, that this too shall pass. I think that we are, we've lived through an interesting era in the United States, going back 30 or so years, uh, different from previous eras. It's running out of gas. Polarization is one sign of it. There are other signs of it as well, which I'll talk about. And America, the United States, is faced, facing a situation where it's going to have to find a way to renew itself <coughs> economically and politically. We've done it in the past. The Great Depression, 
the 1980s, maybe even going back to the Civil War, although we wouldn't want to repeat that. But America has periodically gone through crises where things haven't worked, and we found a way to get through them by reorganizing ourselves. Now, uh, uh, past performance is no guide to future success, I guess as they say. So there's no guarantee that the United States can get out of it. The only thing we can say is that we've done it in the past, and on that basis perhaps we can be hopeful about it. So let me, let me run through some aspects of this that kind of get beyond the polarization and kind of look beyond it from a historical point of view. And I have some slides for you. And let's see here. Does it work? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward to one particular slide and leave it up there so for you to look at. And I'll go back through these. Okay. So we had a debate about this particular slide. I want you to look at this. This is shares of, na uh, shares of national income of the top 1% and the top one-tenth of 1% going all the way back to 1913. And uh, this is really from a, an article that was written by the, one of the colleagues of Thomas Piketty, who wrote this big book on inequality a few years ago. They went back and got all this data on the distribution of income and wealth in the United States and the Western countries from 1900 to the present. Okay, so I'll leave that up there. So Piketty, divides the history of modern capitalism into three long phases. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. So you have, in Europe, you have one phase running from 1870 to the outbreak of World War I in 1914, which breaks that up. In the United States, that would run from the end of the Civil War to the stock market crash of 1919. That's phase one. That's an early phase of industrial capitalism. They claim uh, and a lot was happening, a lot of immigration into the United States, a lot of development of industry, electricity is invented, the motor cars developed, uh, uh, new industries are created, the radio, uh, and so on. <coughs> and he claims that's a period of inequality. The middle decades of the century from 1930 to roughly 1980 are a period, I call it the golden age of social democracy. It's inaugurated by Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. Tax rates go to 90% on the richest uh, 1%. Uh, it's a period where uh, union, unions become strong. Uh, we have oligopolies in many of our major industries, auto, steel, aluminum. Uh, and uh, the stock market doesn't even grow that much through that period. And then we have a new period beginning in 1980 and running roughly to the present. Uh, roughly with Ronald Reagan's election here and Margaret Thatcher's election in Great Britain, where we cut taxes, deregulate, and we have a new kind of system coming into place where there's now greater inequality. Now there is some dispute, as I learned tonight, about the accuracy of these data. I'd be happy to hear that they're wrong. I'm not quite convinced that they are, but they do illustrate these periods I'm talking about. I would add one, one additional period. So we have those three long periods. I would add another one in American history, one running from 1800 to 1860. That was, now all these periods are different. This is under the same constitution. The economy that the United States had from 1800 to 1860 was based upon the export of cotton. The Founding Fathers did not anticipate this. They didn't anticipate a lot of things. Uh, but they didn't anticipate this. So we built an economy in the early part of the 19th century based upon the export of cotton. What happened was that some guys in Great Britain devised a, a big loom, a big machine that would uh, spin cotton thread and wool into fabrics and clothes. And they got the idea that let's take this gigantic loom and put it into something called a factory. And we'll recruit the youngsters who are living in the orphanage to run this. And thus was invented a factory in the mass production of textiles. And soon 
these textile factories balloon in Great Britain. This is during the 1780s, 1790s. That's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The question is where are they getting this cotton? Now the gigantic demand for cotton, because they can make cotton, mass produce cotton, they get it from the American South. And of course it's produced by slavery. slavery. So, so cotton in the United States in the early part of the 19th century was the main export product of the United States and the central export product of the entire industrial revolution in the world. Cotton represented about 60% of U.S. exports in, 18, in the 1850s, and uh, Great, Britain, uh, Great Britain imported about 80% of its cotton used in those mills from the United States, from the American South, and of course, we also built these mills in the North. So that, was, uh, that whole system was destroyed by the Civil War. In the 1850s, the uh, the most valuable piece of real estate in the United States was in the Delta region of Mississippi because of the cotton that was grown there. Now today, of course, it would be in maybe Beverly Hills or maybe Manhattan someplace. So that was, that's a, a sign of how different that system was to the system that followed it. Now, okay, so you can divide the history of modern capitalism and the Industrial Revolution from into those four phases, I would say. Originating really with the creation of the American uh, system, with the American ratification of the U.S. Constitution. Now, as I say, the Founding Fathers never anticipated any of this. Maybe Hamilton did a little bit because, you know, he wanted to use, uh, he wanted to use uh, government subsidies to build these uh, uh, silk and cotton mills in uh, New Jersey which Jefferson was horrified by that. But, uh, so the, the expansion of the whole cotton industry drove the world economy, and of course it was based on slavery. So let me just go back, whoops, getting ahead of myself. Okay, so, uh, you, can, you can graph uh, the party systems onto these, onto these economic systems. Typically, uh, we've had a one and a half party system in the United States, in this sense. We've had a dominant party, what I call a regime party, the party that brings the, the economic system into being. And, uh, and devises the policies that keep it going. So from that period from 1800 to 1860, it was Jefferson's Democratic Party. There's some changes that take place in this period. I call them democratic expansionist regime. When this starts, the United States is a small uh, a nation state, empire, on the shores of the Atlantic. By 1850, it controls the entire continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It's an amazing thing that happens, uh, through, partly through conquest, partly through acquisition. This is, this is guided and led by the Democratic Party of Jefferson and Jackson. Uh, they win 12 of the 15 presidential elections in that period. They, dom they hold uh, majorities in the Senate and the House. Importantly, they win the first six elections of the period from 1800 to 1824, and it's that domination through that period that allows them to put their imprint on the system. Uh, and what is it that they were concerned about? They were very much concerned about federal control of the national economy. They wanted to disperse control of the states. I think they were mainly worried that the national government would somehow interpose itself into the slave system in that period. They also didn't like government debt or any government regulation. And of course, they wanted an agrarian system, not an industrial commercial system. Uh, so uh, that period was a uh, wrong way. That period was broken up by the Civil War. So now from 1865 to 1930, you have an entirely different kind of regime, which is an industrial regime. It's based in the North. The South was the most prosperous part of the country 
prior to the Civil War. Now it's the poorest youth. The South in this whole period is now a backward part of the United States. And the Republican Party now dominates it based upon uh, the tariff, the gold standard, and the control of the national market for American industry. And the Republicans, as I say, dominate the presidential elections. Democrats only win four presidential elections in that whole period. Cleveland won twice and Woodrow Wilson won twice. Otherwise, it's a Republican system. Pretty much dominate uh, the Senate and House majorities. Democrats were competitive in part of that period. Oops, wrong way. Okay. So then we get the democratic welfare regime that's inaugurated by FDR. Uh, beginning in the 30s, we described it. So this is, the, this is that period that Thomas Piketty and the others called the golden age of social democracy. Uh, Democrats win most of the uh, presidential elections in that period, and they dominate the Senate and the House. Republicans are only able to muster majorities a couple times, once in 1946 elections and once in the 52 elections, I think. Otherwise, Democrats dominate the Congress. And uh, they're able to push forward the New Deal and Great Society regimes uh, that uh, have, which basically shape the welfare state that we have today, Social Security, <coughs> Medicare, Medicaid, civil rights, and the whole raft of other things that we have devised in this period. Uh, so that ran out of gas in the 1970s. Those of you who can remember the 1970s, remember the unemployment, the inflation, the gas lines, the Iran hostages, a lot of bad things were happening. Nixon was uh, driven out of office. Uh, his successor was defeated. Uh, Jimmy Carter was then defeated. So we had a succession of failed presidents in that period as well. Uh, but, but politics was not quite as polarized. We just had a, had a hard time of it. So, okay, so let's fast forward to this period. Okay, 1980 to 2014, we have much more of a stalemate. I think when uh, we talk about the polarization, this is more or less what we're talking about because I said that we've had a one and a half party system in the past. What that means is that the dominant regime party defines the contours of the system and the minority party has little choice but to go along. It can't really challenge the system because it'll be destroyed. It can challenge it at the margins. So this is why we get this pattern of one party being dominant and the other party having to accommodate to it. So, but we don't have that now from uh, 1980 to the present, you get pretty much a stalemate, a back and forth stalemate between the parties. The presidential elections tend to be pretty close, and there tends to be an oscillation of power in the Senate and the House. Whenever you get a situation, a kind of a stalemate situation, the participants, whether it's in politics or international systems, they're looking to break out. How can I get a breakout? Uh, Barack Obama thought he had a breakout in 2008. He did get 60 votes in the Senate. Just like Franklin Roosevelt had in 1932. Let's push our agenda through. The problem was that Franklin Roosevelt added to his majorities in 1934 and 1936, and Obama lost his majorities in the congressional elections that followed, which suggested that the, the public opinion really was not where he thought it was and was not sufficient to generate a breakthrough. And I don't see a breakout happening anytime soon. Might, could happen anytime. Okay, so that's kind of where we are in this new system that we've erected since 1980. Uh, now, Piketty, the economist, focuses very heavily on inequality as the defining feature of these different regimes a great deal of inequality uh, in that earlier period before the Depression, greater equality in the middle period, the FDR, Great Society period, and now an increase in inequality. Now, the only problem I have with that is, one, we did discuss whether or not those numbers that he has are valid. I'd be very gratified to hit, learn that these numbers that I showed you earlier are not valid. Uh, the economists are going to have to work that out. But the thing that I would say is 
a lot of other things were going on here besides inequality. So let's talk about some of those things. Okay, so uh, let's just talk about some of the economics and finances of it. Uh, I've shown you the long-term interest rates. I guess that's the 10-year bond going back to 1790. That takes it back a long way. And the one thing, let's, let's look at that period really from 1950 to 1980, and then look at that period from 1980 to the present. Interest rates seem to move in kind of long-term patterns. Not sure what caused that, economists aren't exactly sure what caused that, but from 19, late 1940s until about 1980, the pattern is upward. Interest rates are gradually going up in the early period, then they go straight up in the 1970s. An important and remarkable feature of this present period is the substantial decline in interest rates from 1980 to the present. And they continue to go down. Uh, the 10-year bond is now below 2%, I think it's 1.8%. Uh, in 1980, it was 14%. Prime rate was 20% in that period. So we've had a period of substantially declining interest rates. And that's one of the features of this period. How long can that go on? No one knows. Uh, and uh, that's good because we have a lot of debt. And uh, low interest rates allow us to service that debt. OK, so the other characteristic of this is disinflation. So if you look at that period from roughly 1950 to 1980, gradually ascending inflation. Inflation kind of grows gradually until it kind of peaks out in 1980, consumer price index at about 16%. And then it now gradually declines. So these are very good, very good things for the economy. Declining interest rates and disinflation. Very good things in general. And then this is the third factor, third interconnected factor of this year, which is the stock market boom. So beginning in 1982 and running to, this is kind of set up so it accentuates the increase uh, from 1980, but basically the stock market was generally flat in real inflation adjusted terms from 1930 to 1980. People weren't making hundreds of millions of dollars on the stock market. People made a decent living, but they didn't get wildly rich on the stock market. The rich people in America in that period were industrialists who invented something. Ford, uh, other inventors of various kinds, people who controlled oil, that kind of thing. They weren't people who were speculating and buying and selling stocks. That's all changed. So nothing like this has ever happened in the history of the world certainly not in the history of the United States, a boom, a financial boom of this magnitude that when it goes on for so long, it's gone on from roughly 1981 or 82, really to the present. It's still going, really. We thought it ended in 2008, but we've kept it going. So, and a lot of people have gotten wildly rich uh, because of this. So these, the, all these three factors come together to create a very unique period that we've lived through. Interest rates, inflation, and a growing stock market. For those people who live in New York or who live around the stock markets, this is terrific. This is very good. And of course, it's good for rich people because rich people tend to own stocks. Of course, others own it in their pension funds and so on. But uh, the bulk of stocks are owned by wealthy people, and that's got to be a factor on the inequality. Uh, this is just another chart just to show how unusual this period is. This is the ratio of the uh, capitalization of the stock market compared to the GDP. And typically through the whole period, uh, really from the 1920s to the present, it's been the valuation of the stock market has been well below GDP. Only in this present period, starting in the early 1980s, does it accelerate. And to the point where in roughly 2000, 2000, before the stock market crash in 2000, it was almost double uh, GDP. So I think the point here is that uh, we've lived through an unusual period in the last 30 years. 
defined by those interconnected factors. Obviously, low interest rates and disinflation help the stock market and vice versa. I also think that the, all the technological breakthroughs that we've seen, uh, the cell phones and the internet and the computerization, all of all, all that is related to some degree to the boom in the stock market because after all, who is financing all these startups? All the capital that's raised through the stock market are helping to finance all these new startups and innovations. So these things are very much connected. The other thing I just point out uh, is that uh, we had an accumulation of debt really starting in 1980, right at the same time as interest rates decline. That makes sense. Interest rates decline, people take out more debt. Disinflation, stock market boom, and we also have a credit boom. So that red line is the rise of GDP. Uh, I guess that's in nominal terms. And the blue line is the growth in total credit market debt. Total credit market debt is defined as government debt, corporate debt, and household debt. So as you see, for most of this period up to 1980, it pretty much tracks GDP. And beginning in 1980 again, you get this great divergence. So credit, we begin to accumulate a lot of uh, debt in the system so that Today, total credit market debt is about $60 trillion, and U.S. GDP is about $18 trillion. So we have an economy worth about $18 trillion that has to support that debt. Now, you know, low interest rates help. Uh, faster economic growth would help more. So all these things are interconnected. The stock market loves debt. In the 1920s, the New York Times used to run the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve Bank on its front pages on a weekly basis so that the people trading the stocks would know what the position of the Fed was. We don't do that anymore, but the stock markets, the money markets, are very much very sensitive to any, everything the Federal Reserve does in terms of interest rates and the supply of money. So, uh, all right, so one other feature of this period, which is somewhat disconnected from this, is the demographic issue. Now, the kind of the point I'm, I'm getting to is that we've lived through quite a unique period. This is quite different from the period that preceded it in all, in all of these respects. It generally, in a positive direction. So now we have the demographic issue, uh, which is kind of layered onto this problem. So we have the baby boomers. One of the things that goes on in that period in the 1980s is that the baby boomers are kind of growing into their peak earning years. Peak earning years are usually defined as roughly between 35 and 55 or something like that, 30 and 54. That's when kind of people come into their own, become very productive. Uh, they're developing capital, they're saving, they're taking care of families. Uh, all the rest is good for the economy. But when they retire, they're now drawing back on the system. They're drawing back on savings, and of course, we have Social Security, Medicare, and all these pension systems that they begin to draw on. So an aging population is not that great for economic growth. That's what we have in the United States. So the, in the 1960s, the average age of the U.S. population was about 25. Half the population was below 25. That was the baby boom. Today, the average age is about 38. In Germany and in uh, Japan, it's about 46. Uh, those are very rapidly aging populations. And uh, you have to wonder, as those people retire, who's going to support them? There aren't enough young people to support them. In America, we're not that quite that badly off. But I just want to point out the bulge in the 65 and over population that's been taking place gradually, partly because of longevity, but really accelerates beginning about 2010 when the baby boomers start retiring. The baby boomers defined as people born between 1946 and 1963, they turn 65 in 2011, and they'll continue to retire and begin to pull out of the system in terms of retirement funds and their savings and so on, and then a lot of them have stopped working. 
So this, this is an immediate problem in the United States because there are about 80 million baby boomers, all due to retire between 2011 and 2028. So we're going to go from roughly 40 million people over age 65 in 2010 to something 75 to 80 million people uh, uh, over age 65 by 2027, 20, 2028. 20, all these people now eligible for Social Security and Medicare and all the rest. There are, are as many people turning age 65 every year in America as there are turning 21 or 22, about 4 million people. 4 million people turn uh, 21, 22, the age of your graduating seniors, and something close to that turns 65. So we have as many people really leaving the workforce as we have entering it, which is not a good situation for economic growth. So, and that's going to be a situation we're going to be dealing with for another dozen years or so until we get past this bubble. Uh, well, this is the inequality thing. This is the another feature of this era. Now, as I said, some people dispute these numbers. Top number is the uh, the the growth of pre-tax income of the top one percent since 1980, 1979, really, down to the present. So that's grown. You see, it oscillates with the decline in the stock market, but that's grown. You know, more than it's more than tripled. That the uh, top one percent and the bottom ninety-nine percent—that's the red line. You know, that's grown. Uh, I guess forty-five percent over that period. It's grown, but not as rapidly as the top one percent. So, what's caused that? What's caused all these things going together? I think. The stock market boom is one factor. Another factor is the globalization of the economy. So in 1980, uh, the Cold War was still going on. Russia was not in the world economy and all of its satellites. They were brought into the world economy. China was still a communist state. I guess it still technically is. Uh, 1.6 billion people was not in the international economy. Some of the states in Southeast Asia, not in the international economy. They've all been brought into this global economy in this period. Maybe that uh, hurts some of our workers who have to compete with workers in China and elsewhere. Probably it benefits uh, stocks and corporations who can trade internationally in this global market. And this just illustrates the historical pattern. So all these, all these things, this is, seems to me to be part of a regime that's we've built since 1980, which is much different than the one that preceded it. Now, Republicans seem to want to continue this. Democrats seem to want to go back to something that we had before. Someone has told a joke that Republicans want to live in the 1950s, pro-family, pro-religion. Democrats want to work in the 1950s. High tax rates, labor unions, all the rest. Uh, but we're not going back to the 1950s. We don't have that, that option. Uh, let me go one more. Okay, so there, there is the annual year-to-year -year economic growth in the American economy going back to 1950. And the point I want to point, uh, raise here is that the growth in our economy is gradually slowing year to year. Those are the percentages over there. So you see, in the 1950s and 1960s, it was pretty common for us to get 6% growth per year. Look over here in that period, in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, we had several years where we had 6% growth or more, several years, 5% growth. So the average in that period from 1950 to the late 60s was maybe 4.5% very good economic growth and of course that's the period when the baby boomers were young it was also the period when we passed some of these new entitlement programs medicare being the principal one passed in 1965 why should why couldn't we afford it with six percent annual growth but of course uh you can't look that far into the future so uh the last time we had six percent annual growth in the american economy was 1984 you see that peak there, that's 1984. 
The last time we had 4% economic growth was back 1998. That was the norm in the 50s and 60s. And the last time I think we had 3% economic growth was maybe 2005. I'm not sure about this one over here. We may have had it last year. But that all points to an economy that's gradually slowing down. Now, that may be typical. As economies mature, they don't grow quite as fast. We do have the demographic headwind uh, that's, that's somewhat working against us. So we have, do have, I think, an anomaly. The anomaly being, how come the stock market can grow so fast when the economy is slowing down? I don't really have an answer to that. That's, that. This is one of the problems that we have in terms of the anger and polarization out there in the economy. We have an economy that's working very well for some people, but in terms of economic growth, which really sustains the incomes of the middle classes, it's not doing that well. And that's, that's a factor. And now if you throw polarization into this, which makes it difficult to address whatever problems we have. We have an accumulating set of issues. Uh, we have slow growth. We have a lot of debt out there in the system. And uh, we have a polarized politics. We have an economic system that's very much dependent on a lot, of, a lot of debt and low interest rates and a high stock market. How long can that last? Well, maybe it can last a long time. But my thought is that this, this thing seems to be coming to an end, uh, partly because of slowing economic growth, partly because of polarization. Um, and uh, whenever we have a stock market rout or another recession, we're going to have great difficulties in the United States paying for all the debt that we've accumulated. There are going to be cities and pension funds <coughs> that are going to be underwater. We may have to renegotiate a lot of pledges and promises that we made to people, including seniors for their Social Security or for their Medicare, or for students for their loans, uh, for all sorts of things. You can imagine what would happen to this college. This college, I talked to your terrific president today, has an endowment of $230 million <coughs> currently, roughly. And out of that, they probably draw 10 to $15 million per year to pay for the expenses of the college. Some of it goes into student aid and other things. Now imagine if uh, suddenly that was cut in half to $100 million, and instead of drawing 10 to $15 million, now you only have $5 million for all these things that you're doing. You'd have to reduce your standard of living in this college. You wouldn't be able to hire as many people. You wouldn't be able to pay as many people the salaries that they're earning. You'd have to make an adjustment. Now, it wouldn't be so bad if it bounced back. But if it doesn't bounce back, that creates a more or less permanent problem. So I'm landing somewhat on the pessimistic side of where things are headed, because I think this system that we've built is somewhat fragile for the reasons that I've gone into and it's very vulnerable to a crash or a recession, which could be set off by anything, God knows what. I don't know when it will happen, but it's happened in the past. In 2008, the stock market lost 50% of its value. It bounced back very quickly. In 2000, it lost about 30% of its value. In the mid-1970s, it lost about 50% of its value uh, in just a couple of years. It does happen and has happened in the past, my question is, can we weather that storm in the United States today? Now, we did get through the Great Depression. That was a very different country. People lived on farms. Uh, the families were tight-knit. They believed in religion. And they weren't used to a high standard of living. How do we adjust if this happens? I'm not saying that it will. Uh, but it seems to me that there's no obvious solution to the problem. So in the 1930s, we had the Great Depression. Franklin Roosevelt and the Democratic Party were able to put together a whole package of things that had gradually brought us out of that situation. Now, a lot of that is debatable, uh, but a few of the things may have worked. In the 1980s, we cut taxes and deregulated. But after you've cut taxes from 70% down to 30%, as we did in the 1980s, you don't have a lot of room to cut it back anymore. We've done that. 
We don't have that ammunition to draw on anymore. Of course, the Federal Reserve has done a great deal also to keep the system stable, and they're going to run out of ammunition. So uh, my thought is that just as we have in the past have gone through crises of different kinds, and we've had to reorganize our system to deal with it, we're going to be faced with that same situation in the next 10 years or so, I think. The demographic issue is very important. And the fragility of the system in terms of all the debt that we've accumulated. Uh, but compared to other countries, the United States is very resilient. It's a big country. It's not governed so much from the center as some other polities are. That's a good thing. Uh, that gives us a lot of flexibility to experiment. We still have a more or less free economy to adjust. And we're in a better position to weather that storm than other countries, say the countries in the Euro. So I end with that thought that uh, we've, uh, we've kind of come, we're coming to the end of an era. Uh, it's reflected in our politics and the polarization and the anger out there and in a kind of gradually weakening economy that we can muddle through for a while, but we're not, uh, we're, we're vulnerable to a crisis. And uh, that's, that's uh, kind of where I'll, I'll leave it. It's uh, something that I say that we've gone through and we can get through it again. Thank you. somewhat, uh, but perhaps not for jobs that Americans want to do. So, uh, yes, yeah, so is your thought, your thought is that if Donald Trump builds the wall, that's just going to make it a bigger problem? Well, it's more that, like, um, it's like, in fact, kind of the general sense that you're hoping that we get to this point, and um, once we get to this point, we're going to reach a new political era where we are able to deal with the new problems. But, um, like, what if, like, the problems that we're facing <coughs> Um, right, I don't disagree with that. Okay, the demographic issue is, is real. It's not as severe in the United States as it is elsewhere, because we do have a higher birth rate and we do have immigration. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's a problem. But I guess I ha I've had some, uh, I have some faith that we have a creative political system. That is to say, the American people are not going to accept, if they can help it, uh, uh, continued failure. They're going to insist that we do something. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. That's the nature of our political system. Now, there are some problems that you can't solve, no matter how much you want to solve them. And you, you're kind of pointing out one. You need some demographic vitality to generate growth. How do you generate growth in an economy? Well, one way is population growth. We've done that in America really from 4 million people in 1790 to 350 million people today. That's been a big factor. And of course, productivity, machinery, technology, science, those are the two things that drive growth. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that our demographic situation is quite as bad as you described. Um, 
the, I'm not sure exactly what the birth rate is. <coughs> is it 2.1? So that's about replacement, a little bit higher than replacement, right? Uh, so, you know, if you went back to 1955, it'd probably be double that, right? I, I haven't looked at those numbers. So, look, that's an aspect of affluence, I would say, right? That is, we become richer, and it's also a fa an aspect of the liberation of women. They're not having as many children, and they have them later. Uh, you know, they have careers, they have jobs, people plan their families. No one has eight, nine, ten kids anymore. Or some few do, but not many. Uh, I grew up in a family with six children. Uh, we have a much smaller family. Probably that's true across the board. Uh, so, you know, I don't really have. We do have. We do have a way of adjusting to these things. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that you need a lot of forward planning to adjust to. So. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on the, on the demographic. And I don't know if people have projected out in the future, we're 2.1 now, where are we going to be in 20 years? Do, do, do we have any idea? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, you can get, you can get around it by productivity to some degree. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't disagree that we do have that, that demographic headwind. Uh, which is not manifested not only in the aging population, but in the slower birth rate. Yep? So, do you have a lot of theories about why polarization is increasing and the change of the economy? Like, it's, it's a very Marxist kind of view. Uh, do you have any ideas, because I feel like most discourse, there is a lot of discourse about class inequality, but most of the discourse I see these days seems to be more cultural or technological or especially pertaining to race and gender. Do you have any theories for uh, what kinds of causes for polarization yeah. there might well, be? Well, I, I do agree with you. I don't think it's entirely that. The, the, a rapidly growing economy will kind of overcome a lot of problems, uh, just like in the family. Uh, if you have money, uh, the problems that you have are probably not going to be quite as bad. So that is a factor. But I think you're right, the polarization that we see in the in America today is heavily cultural. Uh, it has to do with things like religion or abortion or gay marriage uh, or any number of things related to that. And only secondary and I think that's probably true of the Congress as well. Immigration is another polarizing issue. So uh, what's driving that? Well, uh, you know, we do have, in addition to the whole birth rate issue, we do have demographic changes taking place. So, in 1970, the United States was about 87 percent white, Caucasian. It's about 70 percent now, and kind of dwindling. So, you do have a kind of an introduction of uh, <coughs> these national issues into our politics. Immigration seems to be. Uh, something that does, that creates a lot of divisiveness in in the country. Look, Donald Trump was propelled to the top just by saying one thing: "I'm going to build a wall. I'm going to send everybody back." That was it. That's all he had to say. Uh, so uh, I think those would be factors. I think over a period of time, in any system, people choose choose up sides, so that. Uh, you know, in America today, the various institutions are basically chosen sides between left and right. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, they say the evangelical churches have chosen to join the right nation. Colleges and universities have kind of joined the left nation. Uh, the public employee unions, they've joined the left nation. Uh, a lot of religious Americans have joined the right nation. And they separate out into neighborhoods and churches and organizations on that basis. And they talk to one another, people who agree with them. And that tends to accentuate their differences. Uh, it tends to reinforce their points of view. Uh, you know, you can uh, you know you can go through life heavily in America today without talking to someone who, who disagrees with you, who might belong to a different party. You can watch your own television network, read your own newspapers, magazines, internet sites, all the rest. So. 
Uh, you have all those things contributing to a kind of a cultural difference. You have the red states and the blue states, and they organize themselves in different ways. The, uh, the blue states, the so-called blue state model, as a higher tax, higher regulation model. Uh, the so-called red state model is a lower tax, uh, more business friendly model. And they're probably an equal number of those states. And then there's some states like Ohio that are in between. And one, some of those states are controlled by Democrats, some by Republicans. They have an entirely different kind of politics. And people begin to choose up sides. They migrate to these different places and they reinforce it. Sometimes they migrate to these different places and they may mix it up a little bit with us when northerners move to Florida. So, uh, you know, you have, a, you have a kind of a, a lot going on. My view would be that the, the slow growing economy is a factor in the so called anger and frustration out there. I don't think it accounts for the polarization, but it is a factor in the anger that we see. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, well, I was just wondering, um, so you've talked a lot about economic inequality and you pretty much demonstrated that it started more or less, what do you say, like late 1970s, 80s? That's the pattern. More yeah. or less. Yeah. Well, then wouldn't that suggest that there's been a failure with the kind of radical neoliberal policies that have been set forth by certain parts of our government? When you have in your era, like after World War II, as you talked about, the post-war consensus with labor unions, with high taxation, with a stronger social safety net, doesn't that kind of prove that the way out of this is to go, I guess, really go forward in a way by looking backwards to the times when we've had the most prosperity for America, for most Americans? You know, um, as an argument that's made, I don't agree with it, because I don't think we can go back. Well, why not? Well, OK, so let's look at that period of the 1950s and 60s when we had that rapid growth. The rest of the world was flat on its back from World War II. You know, Germany was not making cars. Japan was not making cars. They were kind of getting themselves off the, off the, their, the backs. Their, their economies were destroyed in the war. The United States dominated the world economy. We were, we were loaning Germany and Japan and England and France money to buy our products. And that drove our growth. Well, once those, the, one of the things that happened in the 1970s is those countries came back into the market. They destroyed our auto industry, destroyed our steel industry through their competition. And we were still acting as if the 1950s and 60s were still in place. We're never going to reproduce that temporary environment. So uh, the economic prosperity of that period was not simply caused by the tax rate and the New Deal policies or the unionization. The other thing I would say is that this economy that we've now evolved over the last 30 years, manufacturing has declined very rapidly. I don't know what the numbers are, but if you look at the charts, I mean, it's increasingly an economy that's dominated by insurance, real estate, financial intermediaries, and various kinds of services. And uh, unions, take private sector unions. In 1960, they had about 40% of our private sector workers. It's about 7% today. I don't know in this kind of, in the kind of economy we built that you could ever resurrect that. Now, we have unionized our public sector. That's somewhat made up for it. Uh, but that's creating its own problems, pensions and so on. So I don't think we can reproduce that economy. Now, you could say, well, let's raise tax rates to 80 or 90 percent marginal tax rates, like as we had in the 1950s under a Republican administration. Uh, what would we do with it? What would we do with it? Okay, let's. We could have universal health care. Seriously, we could, which would be a lot cheaper. Yeah, because possibly. A, I mean, yeah. we have a system right now where insurance companies make lots of money, drug companies make lots of money, and they don't produce them. They're rent seekers. Yeah, but that would not necessarily help the economy and that economic would. growth. I think, you think, I think it, it would? really would. Yeah, but that's not what we did in the 1950s. It'd be a different kind of model. Now, you know, that's one of the things that's being argued. 
Uh, right now, if you tax, you take the top one uh, percent. Uh, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, collects all this data. Actually, there's a lot of money there. The top one percent has about 1.8 trillion dollars of income in 2011. Last time I looked at it, that's about 11 percent of our GDP. In 2011, it would have been like 14 or 15 percent. And uh, I think they pay uh, about 30 percent of that in federal taxes. Their effective tax rate is around 30 percent. So, you know, do the math: 1.8 trillion. Uh, they're probably paying four to five hundred uh, billion dollars in federal taxes. You could increase their tax rate. Maybe you could pull off another hundred billion dollars to raise the top marginal rate from 40 percent to 50 percent. But where would it go? Now you could say, let's earmark it to universal health care. I don't think that would be enough to pay for universal health care. But you're going to throw it into the Congress to disperse. And where would that go? You couldn't redistribute income because I doubt that that money would wind up in the hands of poor people. You might be able to earmark it to the deficit, but that's not the way our Congress behaves, really, or to some other program like that. I'd have more confidence in our ability to do something like that if I had more confidence in our political system to operate on a rational basis. I believe that they, it did operate on a much more of a rational basis in that period we're talking about. But a lot of things have happened in the meantime. We've, thrown, we've created many more interests around the government and thrown them into Washington and created a kind of a stalemate. So I don't discount that. I think it's difficult to do uh, without causing other things to happen. Now, if you go to the inequality thing, if we accept the inequality numbers, I think it's heavily due to two factors, globalization and the stock market. Uh, and, uh, you know, but we don't want to crash the stock market to get rid of inequality. That wouldn't make any sense. That would hurt everybody. And we don't want to throw up tariff barriers around our economy to, take, to deal with globalization. That would also wreck the economy and hurt the world. In terms of inequality, in the United States, the numbers suggest there is greater inequality. But around the world, no. Between 1990 and 2010, a billion people around the world were taken out of extreme poverty, uh, mostly in India and China, due to what's happening. So the whole globalization thing has an effect on us, but it's probably had a beneficial effect uh, around the world. Now, we care more about Americans. I agree with that, and I do too. Uh, but you know, you have to uh, think about that as well. So, you know, look, you can make that case. It's a difficult case, I think. It's going to be difficult for us to do in this environment. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I mean, like, I want other people to answer okay. questions. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, anybody over, over here? So that might be a little bit, uh, my question might be a little bit delayed in the discussion. Um, but personally, I'm not familiar with, um, I'm very familiar with um, political economy. So, um, can you state your arguments um, and what your dependent variables or dependent variable and independent variables are? Because I wasn't very sure where you, uh, what your argument was when you were. Well, you know, I'm not sure what the independent variable. I was trying to start it by talking about what's what's behind polarization, and I kind of came around to the idea that the kind of the economic system is not kind of generating the wealth that it did in past decades. That we're kind of leading up to a situation where we're going to have to address that. Um, and so the, another factor I was looking at, what's the cause of the inequality? Stock market and globalization. Um, and uh, so uh, these, you know, those factors, slowing growth, the stock market, that could explain a lot of things uh, in addition to polarization and inequality. But I didn't... I don't, I don't think it. I don't think it perfectly explains polarization. I think it explains the, a lot of the anger out there. Uh, I think to really to account for polarization, you got to look for also at a lot of cultural things that have happened. I mentioned some of them, which is kind of the, the sorting out of the population into different and discrete kinds of organizations 
the university goes one way, the evangelical churches go another way, the red states go one way, the blue states go the other way. That's been a gradual thing that's been happening uh, in our country for the last uh, 30 years or so. So you're, okay, so at the beginning of your talk, you said that polarization started at the beginning of the 1980s. And then you, you listed all these factors that uh, showed a change in the beginning of the 1980s. How do we know that these factors actually uh, cause polarization? I, I don't think they, they do completely cause polarization. I think those things are, are, are contributors to it. Polarization is, you know, I think a characteristic that's been developing since the 1980s. But a lot of things have been going on in the economy besides the things I talked about. So I don't have I don't have a complete explanation for where polarization came from. I just have a lot of things that I'm kind of putting up as a background to contribute to it. Uh, we talked a lot about demographic changes as a sort of future problem at the top of the next ten plus years. Um, but there are, are two other things on my mind, which also are something which certainly my generation has to think a lot about, uh, a lot more than your generation did, which is that um, first automization. So if you have you know uh, increasing sort of automization, maybe there will be fewer jobs. That's hard to say. It's hard to predict. But it's a possibility to think about. And the second is environmental concerns. Um, you know, every time that way, as the temperature increases, your agricultural output decreases. Uh, so yes, our technology is also getting better, so we're still producing more <coughs> grain for per model, you might say. But in the future, if that becomes an issue, you also get you know, rising water levels, so there's less room for people to live and have to move, and have people who don't generally like moving. So in the next 50 years, 100 years, you know, that, what, what do you think of those as important factors for the economic? You mean the whole global warming argument, yeah. the population pressures, and so on? Impossible to assess, I would say. Now, you know, we did in the 1970s have all sorts of forecasts about uh, population uh, pressing on resources, the Malthusian argument, and it didn't really happen that way. So, well, it didn't happen in the U.S. in Europe, but Africa, you mentioned that in the 19, uh, I think it was the 1930s, the average population of the U.S. was about 25. Well, it's that in India now. Yeah, sure. Um, and it's lower that in some other places, right. like Mexico. And right. Some. Africa is about 21, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, with India uh, and Bangladesh and Pakistan as well, two other very large countries, um, you know, it's already actually a pretty dense population, so thinking about immigration, they might have to move, but that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing for us. But, um, you know, at least how about in terms of automization, if you have, you know, increased automization, then you have fewer people living, and what is that? I mean, how, what would be a solution to that? That's sort of the well, I mean, you're kind of adding on to the list of things that I have yeah. enumerated. Uh, but you know, automation has not caused these problems again in the past. Yeah, it has, and so yeah. there are several people who say that new jobs will arise. Which you can't Making so people have to make them and so on. Right. So, so computers, you know, increase productivity, but they didn't in the end probably reduce right. employment. More people are working with computers and so on. So you know, you do have the the forecasts of robots uh, doing work and that kind of thing, and the people who own the robots. Uh, will kind of dominate the economy. That's a kind of a science fiction idea right now. Right now. It could happen. But uh, look, I mean, 40 years ago, we wouldn't have forecast a lot of the things that we're doing now. We're probably going to have a driverless car uh, pretty soon. Uh, in 10 years, a lot of us will be driving electric cars. Maybe all of us will. Uh, so you know, technological change, once it starts, often accelerates. So, but Do you think the technological change will help? Or I, you know, I don't have an answer to that. I'm generally positive on that. I think technology is good. The record of the last 200 years suggests that technology does improve yes. living standards. So that's, that's good. Uh, you know, the more science, the more technology, the more productivity we have, generally the better our living standards. 
we wouldn't all be, uh, you know, in this classroom tonight if we didn't have an economy that, you know, allowed us to leave the farm and so on. A uh, hundred years ago, people your age were working already on the farm or whatever. They weren't going to college. So, uh, you know, I think the prognosis for technology is generally probably positive. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe just try to quickly, I guess. I was kind of curious, um, so like with all that in mind, and you know, you ended with saying, like, we might have to just muddle through the polarization. I guess I was kind of curious, in your opinion, like, in order to maybe, like, solve the possible polarization or for it to go away, do you think it's kind of part of, like, more economic action or shock, or, like, more, like, political action or shock? Like, like, what needs to change more? Like, is it more well, I, I guess uh, the drift of my thought is that, you know, some crisis will erupt, I'm thinking about some crisis in the economy, that will change the balance of power between the parties, and one of the parties will kind of find a solution to the problem we're in, and that will end the stalemate, and some of it the polarization. Uh, that was where I'm headed, and I'm thinking that's most likely to come from a recession or a stock market crash. Could come from a war or something like that, uh, but some unforeseen event could uh, cause this this crisis and uh, bring us face to face with these problems that are kind of drifting, taking us along. Yes, ma'am. So, if the recession of two thousand eight didn't help end this polarization as you predicted, what guarantees that a future problem? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. <laughs> Uh, you know, with a lot of us, when in 2008 said, geez, you know, this is like the Great Depression, and this is a very large event, and it's going to cause a tremendous disruption. It didn't really do that because we did manage, for a lot of reasons, pyrotechnics by our policymakers to kind of bounce back from it, more in the stock market than in the real economy, I would say. Uh, now, you know, I think that that event did drive American politics to the left. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think it would have been likely that Barack Obama might have been elected prior to that event happening. That event, I think, uh, uh, caused a lot of people to lose faith in the market system and the policies we've been following, try something else. But of course, the political system bounced back and the Republicans captured the Congress. So it didn't break it up. So your question is, why do I think that another such event will break it up? Because, uh, one, you know, when you, when you pile them up, they tend to have accelerating influences. My, the other thought is that I, I don't know that we have the ammunition to get us out of another one. We may have used it all up. So if it happens again, we're not going to bounce out of it quite as quickly. And that will cause a, a very large political reaction. But, you know, not, not, you know, the other scenario is that we could just have long-term stalemate in America. We could have, you know, a slu a, a, uh, we could have stock market crashes and we could have uh, recessions, but we could still have the ongoing stalemate and polarization between the parties that doesn't allow us really to address the problems uh, in any direct or significant way, like we did in, say, in the 1930s or 1980s. That could happen as well. Mm -hmm. So, do you honestly not think that we, that the parties can convert in order to take care of major issues like the economy without it being something as detrimental as the recession? As the recession? I, I don't see any evidence uh, that they will come together prior to a crisis. In other words, it seems unlikely to me that they're in agree on any preemptive solution that would prevent a crisis from happening. I don't see any evidence that, that anything can happen, but I see no evidence that's going to happen. You know, we've had all sorts of commissions that have put forward solutions to this, that, and the other thing, to the deficit or immigration or whatever. And uh, at the moment, it becomes difficult for one of the parties, uh, they drop it. You know, we did have various, various uh, solutions, quote unquote, to the deficit in the 1980s and 1990s. You, you know, none of you remembers this. We had Graham Rudman, Graham Rudman's, all these formulas that the Congress adopted to limit spending growth. 
And as soon as it became difficult, they abandoned them. As soon as they really had to start cutting, let's forget about it. Uh, so that's kind of the pattern. We're not going to act until we absolutely have to act. That's one of the characteristics of this system we're in. One more question. Okay. Uh, really quickly, alternatively to a single devastating historical event, to realign the party system as a solution to the polarization, do you see political anger and voter disappointment as positive, less, uh, less singular historical and more a continuous force to change the alignments of the party as opposed to the Senate? You mean the anger might kind of generate some beneficial reforms? Right. Well, I think Trump is a response to this frustration and anger. It's a surprising one because we talked about the parties being ideological, but Trump does not appear to be that ideological. He's not really a conservative in the Ronald Reagan sense. He's been all over the map. So uh, he, somebody said people like his attitude not necessarily his ideas, that's what they like. He's so I guess, uh, I'm not sure what other people think. I, I'd be surprised if uh, Donald Trump, if he got elected, would wind up providing a solution to our problems. That would surprise me. Uh, my guess is that would make them worse. But, you know, who knows? Uh, so. Uh, and if a Donald Trump ever got elected, who would be his team? You know, we've talked about that before. Who's his vice, who's his, who's his cabinet, who does he work with in Congress? The guy is, doesn't have a team to play with. So it would be interesting to watch, uh, if you're a political scientist, just, just to watch this unfold. It would be very interesting, but probably not good for the country. I don't think so. I don't think any of the, I, you know, I think the anger is on both sides. It, it doesn't appear to me to be particularly constructive. I'm not even sure about its focus. Somebody said that in New Hampshire, all the voters were angry, but unemployment rate in New Hampshire is three and a half, four percent. Uh, the economy in New Hampshire is pretty good. What are they mad about? Well, I don't know. You have to go in there and, and talk to them, but it wouldn't appear to be that it's the economy that they're mad about in New Hampshire. They might be mad about it in other places. You know, maybe it's nothing more than the journalists and the newspaper people are telling everybody they should be angry, and as a consequence of that, they're angry. They think they're angry. I don't really think that, but it's possible. Well, Jim, thank you. Okay, for great.